Here's a rigid body mechanics problem which looks at an accelerating frame of reference in which we have this slender rod which is uh, situated at an angle of 30 degrees with respect to the horizontal and you know normally if this uh, cart would be stationary you would expect this wheel to go down and this wheel to go to the right as in um, you would expect this rod to actually start rotating until it would become horizontal but from experience you can imagine that there's a certain acceleration which uh, keeps the rod from sliding and it allows it to maintain its inclined position of uh, 30 degrees so this is the kind of problem that you might see not so much as a high school student but you'll probably or you could probably see this as a high school student if you're preparing for some uh, more like high-end competitions or olympiads but this is something that you can get as an engineering student um, if you're first or second year doing something like aerospace or mechanical or uh, maybe civil engineering and if you'd like to see anything similar to this on the channel let me know in the comments so the way to do this uh, is essentially to first of all draw a free body diagram of the rod right so we have the rod we know the angle and we're asked to find the acceleration we don't really know anything else uh, in this question we don't really know the length or the mass of the rod but as you'll see we won't actually care about uh, either of those so let's draw the free body diagram and by that i mean let's draw the rod itself so this is going to be my rod so i'm going to draw it in this way I'm going to ignore the wheels in the diagram, but the wheels are there and the wheels are there to essentially prevent friction. That's one reason. And now I'm going to draw the forces acting on the rod, right? So as usual, we have weight. So the rod being uniform means that, right? So the keyword here is uniform. It means that the weight is acting at the center of the rod and it's obviously acting downwards. And then we have two more forces to take into account. We have the normal reaction force here, which let's call this one N1. And we have another normal reaction force here, which is N2, right? If we had friction, then, you know, we would have to draw friction force this way and maybe a friction force this way. But in this case, that's not um, applicable because we ignore friction. So... The other thing to keep in mind is that the rod is accelerating to the right with this constant acceleration A. So essentially, the rod undergoes a translation motion. So the rod undergoes pure translation, right? And pure translation means that the angular acceleration of the rod is zero. Right? It's not rotating about its center of mass or about any other point. So we're going to be able to use the fact that there is no angular acceleration. So at this point, I would just write the three equations of, or let's call them the two equations of motion, uh, which will be split out into three because the, the, the equation for translation which is a vector equation, will have two components. So what I mean by that is uh, the sum of forces is equal to the mass of the rod times the acceleration of the center of mass. So because it's a 2D problem, right, this one has two equations within it. So there's the equation for x and then there's the equation for y. And also we have the fact that the sum of moments about any point, let's call that point P, is going to be equal to the position vector to the center of mass, uh, cross product mass times the acceleration of the center of mass, and then plus the moment of inertia with respect to the center of mass times the angular acceleration. So those are the two general formulas that you would use for a rigid body, for 2D rigid body problem to find whatever you have to find. So let's start with the forces. Now, 
in the x direction we only have one force which is n1 so we're going to write that n1 is equal to the mass times the acceleration of the center of mass the acceleration of the center of mass is just a right because because the rod is translating each point on the rod including its own center of mass is moving with that acceleration so that's that's all we have and also we can say that from a vertical perspective so we have two forces uh, which are acting vertically we have n to n mg so we have n2 minus mg is equal to the mass times the acceleration in the y direction which is of course zero so that tells us that n2 is equal to mg right now this is fine but we still don't know what this acceleration is right so this is what we're trying to find and this is this is where we apply this um, equation for the moment so let's take the moments about a particular point p and i would suggest to pick this point p somewhere convenient right in this case um, i would just put it on the center of mass so i have x y and z the reason you may want to put in the center of mass is because the first term so this term will cancel out because the position vector of the center of mass with respect to the center of mass is zero right and we also have that the angular acceleration is zero so taking all this stuff into account we essentially have that the moments or the sum of moments about the center of mass is equal to zero so let's find what the moments are about the center of mass so about this point here let's call it o the center of mass we have two forces which are producing moments we have n1 which is producing a clockwise moment and we have n2 which is producing a counterclockwise moment so let's write let's also add the angle here so that's the angle theta and let's say let's call this point a and this point b so the moments about the center of mass are the moments of well the moment due to force n1 plus the moment due to force n2 and this is going to be equal to zero right now the moment of force n1 is just the moment arm so we have oa and then cross product with the force n1 plus and then we have ob cross n2 now you don't really need to use vectors at this point um, because finding the moments of those two forces is relatively straightforward but i'll use vectors just to keep a certain level of consistency so let's find what those uh, cross products are so for the first one we have i j and k and then oa is essentially the distance from here to point a so let's find what the components are now the question doesn't tell us what the length of the rod is but we're going to call the length l which means this is going to be half l and this is going to be another half of l right so the x component of oa will be minus l over 2 uh, cosine of theta and the j component is going to be vertical so that's going to be uh, l over 2 sine of theta and 0 and then for n1 so that's force n1 so force n1 only has an x component which we're going to write as n1 and then we have 0 and 0 so this first determinant corresponds to this cross product and then we're gonna uh, write the second one as plus and then we have i j and k so we've got ob so ob is essentially the distance from point o to point b well it's a position vector from o to b and then we have to find the uh, components so the x component will be just the distance from here to here which is l over 2 cosine so 
that's L over 2 cosine of theta, and the J component is going to be minus L over 2 sine of theta, the K component is 0, and N2 is purely vertical, so we can then write 0, N2, and 0, and this whole thing should equal 0. So let's find what those determinants are. So it should be pretty easy to see that both of those determinants only have the K component right the, the i's and the j's are zero so we have k multiplied by so we have zero minus n1 l over 2 sine theta and then plus k and we do the same thing here and we have l over 2 cos theta times n2 and that's equal to zero so if we just extract the components right we have L over 2, so I'll, I'll start with this one first. So L over 2 cos theta times N2 minus L over 2 sine theta times N1 is equal to 0. We can cancel out the L over 2s. So you can see that the length doesn't actually affect the problem in any way because it cancels out eventually. And then we have cosine of theta times, and then N2, we have N2 as mg. So that's m g minus and this is sine theta times and we also know that n1 is mass times acceleration so mass times acceleration equals to zero again we cancel out the mass which tells us that we don't actually need to know about the mass because the final result doesn't depend on the mass so we've got cosine theta times g is equal to a sine theta it's equal to a sine theta, which means that a is equal to g cosine of theta over sine theta. Or you can write this as a is equal to g over tan theta. And that's essentially the answer, right? It doesn't really matter what the angle is. Um, the theta can be anything, but in this case, we know that the angle is 30 degrees, so that's going to be 10 of 30, right? Which is going to be g over, so 10 of 30 is root 3 over 3, which means that the acceleration should be 3 g over root 3, which is g root 3, I guess, meters per second squared, if you want to add the units. And that is, that's it. So it tells us that in this case, for this particular angle, to keep the rod at an angle of 30 degrees with respect to the horizontal, the whole cart, including the rod, must accelerate with an acceleration which is square root of 3 times more than the gravitational acceleration. And that's the end of the question.